Podcasting is more than just talking. It's listening. BSing with Bob Schmidt. The BSing with Bob Schmidt podcast. Instead of learning how, learn to wow. Beyond paper and plastic, author, speaker, and customer service expert, Rob Bell is my latest guest on the uh, on the podcast. Rob, thanks for being on with me. So, you know, I've talked a lot about entrepreneurship. I've talked a lot about business. I've talked a lot about marketing. And in order to kind of pull all three of those together, I think customer service is the one piece that I've been missing in my podcast thus far. And uh, a buddy of mine saw you speak and said that you got to get Rob on. And so uh, welcome welcome to the podcast. And what do you think is the biggest problem that businesses are dealing with when it comes to their customer service? I think that too many times businesses assume their people know what remarkable service is. And that's why I think that um, it's so important that businesses decide what, what makes them special. And so many businesses say, you know, we're here to provide exceptional service. Well, you know what? It's got to be defined. What is your definition of exceptional service? Because people want consistency and they know what they're going to get. And, uh, too many businesses just say we give it, but we don't really put any meat on the bones. And having been, I got into this business uh, having been a, a, an education and training director with a company, and I know how important it is to define what our standards are, what remarkable service looks like, and then holding people accountable in a very positive way. How do we write the manual on what customer service should look like or great customer service should look like? I think you define um, one of the things I like to use in, in the programs. I use the term non-negotiables. So what are your non-negotiables? Now, my background is in the supermarket business. And here's a non-negotiable. Say thank you and mean it. How many times, Bob, have you been served by somebody, you spent a bunch of money, and and they just say, have a great day? What? Have a great day? Shouldn't you say, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. You know, it's these little things that make a big difference. And then, okay, again, the supermarket. We just teach get an eye, give them a high. So fight hard for eye contact. Just, you know, get to know our customers' names. Define what at least good service is, and then... When we can treat people with respect and appreciation, and they look for that opportunity on their own. So they're not just trying to do the base. They're trying to take it to another level. As I like to say, I hate it when people quit and leave, Bob. It's worse when they quit and stay. So <laughs> that's true. They're not just doing it because you're there. If you're the their leader, their supervisor, they're doing it because they're excited and they're proud about what they do, and they and they actually love it. And man. We're having fun. I like to say to my audience, there's nothing wrong with the upward gang. You've got to have fun. I have fun out there. Rob, I think one of the biggest problems with customer service nowadays is that we've all become such accustomed to poor or crappy customer service that if somebody gives any customer service at all, they're considered an A plus in the customer service side. And customer service that is a little bit above average all of a sudden is winning awards, you know? I couldn't agree more. And and I love saying that, you know, I love lousy service in other businesses because it it makes it easier for us to stand out. So you want to provide uh, lousy service, outstanding, as long as, you know, if I'm competing with you in so many places you do go. And that's what, again, service is, is sweating the small stuff, even down to dress codes and things like that. Now, maybe it's because I'm an old man, but I like to go into a place where people are crisp and and you can actually tell they work there because they, they have standards. So... Uh, okay, back to the supermarket business in the in the stores that I worked with. Notice I said with, not for. We didn't, we didn't work. I didn't work for you. I worked with you, and we had high standards where tennis shoes weren't allowed. We wanted nice shoes, and blue jeans weren't allowed, and people wore white shirts, and we wore our name tags. And on the name tags, we didn't allow stupid stickers or any stickers at all. You know, just look sharp. Uh, be proud, and um, uh, I like businesses that have standards like that. And now, I, again, I know some places it's not appropriate. I was down in New Orleans uh, a while back, and I walked into a, a very interesting store, and and people dressed in a, <laughs> a different way, and it worked for that store. You know, people had lots of tattoos and body piercings and cool. That worked for them. Right. So you have to define what works for 
for you. And, you know, I go into some stores and, and they've got a very laid back attitude and it fits their store. That's great. That's totally cool. So kind of know your niche and, and work your niche if that's a possibility. Absolutely. Like I go into Apple stores. You know, I, I'm kind of an Apple computer guy. I love that my Apple computers. And and so everybody has, I think they're wearing blue T-shirts now, and it's got an Apple logo. But they're they're very interesting people. They allow them to have the tattoos and the loud hair and stuff. And it fits Apple's brand. And I love that. And these people are so creative and unique. That's what makes Apple fun. I love going into an Apple store. And the people are excited and they're proud of the services and they're proud of their products. Their attention to the customer is really remarkable. So they're they're treating their people. Let's talk a little bit about that, about the the treatment of the customer, because uh, when you were mentioning when somebody says, have a nice day at the end of the checkout, I've been to a big box store. I remember putting about $120 worth of stuff on the rack, and then when they're going through and checking it out, they just said $122 at the end, not how you doing, did you find everything you're looking for, thank you, any of that stuff. It was all just basically, Here, here's what you owe us, get the hell out of here, yeah. you know? I mean, that's yeah. that's really how it felt to me. Sure. I, I noticed they didn't say please either. No. I mean, this is common sense, but is it common practice? I, uh, you know, sometimes people will say to me, you know, XYZ company really could use you. They are terrible. And I, I can honestly say, well, then they have no desire to work with me. Yeah, I, I love to tell audiences I only work with fantastic organizations because average and below average organizations don't to, to really slow down a little bit and figure out what makes them amazing. And, and you can feel it, can't you? So honestly, I only work with fantastic organizations. So Rob, what what could a small company do today that would allow them to become an average and then eventually a better organization? Because I think they're all starting at average. Even a good company mm-hmm. now, it would have been average 35 years ago. I agree. I think it's so important to include your team members. So if if you uh, if you're a supervisor or you know it could you, it doesn't even have to be, you don't even have to be a store manager or the president of a company if uh, again my my background is in the supermarket if if I'm managing say a grocery department bring the team in and have a discussion have a have a brainstorming or or brain trust meeting about what does remarkable service look like and how can we do it. And define, again, I'm going back to the grocery store. If I'm stocking shelves and as Miss, Mrs. Bacigalup comes walking down the aisle, I'm not going to wait for her to say hi. I'm going to say, hi, how can I help you? You know, set these standards. So defining that and then define the standards and then hold people accountable. So, and, and it starts with holding myself accountable because actions speak louder than words, don't they, Bob? And if I say remarkable service is important and then, some of my teammates see me blowing right by a, a customer and not greeting them, not offering help. Um, well, then they go, well, that's just words. <laughs> we don't have to do it either. So I think you get the team together and ask for them for their input. And, and you want to engage and empower people? Ask for their ideas and actually implement them. Wow, how cool is that? <laughs> He's actually listening to my ideas because we all, we all know what remarkable service is. Really, don't we? I think we do. I would think that we do too, and and it, it's it's probably just as simple as you said. Don't just pay lip service; actually, follow through with what it is that you say that you're going to do when it comes down to customer service or running the place or dealing with your customers or dealing with your you know internal and external customers. You know, one thing I was just going to say: if you have a discussion with your teammates about remarkable service, don't just throw out the question "What." Does remarkable service look like? You know, what are the what are the characteristics and what are the pieces in the puzzle? Separate them into groups. So maybe you don't have a large audience, maybe a large audience or a large group. Maybe you have eight people, or maybe you have four people. Separate them into into just a couple of groups. If it's four, two two groups of two. So get them into some groups, two, three, four groups, and give them give them some time. Give them five minutes. Give them one minute. So I like to keep a sense of urgency on this, so it de- depends on what you're asking them. But ask them to discuss it. Ask them to have a reporter or a recorder in each group. Jot down the characteristics of a remarkable service. And then once you, you know, get those on a chart, I'm getting really detailed, but get those on a flip chart, and then you can even break them down. Then how, how do we achieve that? 
and um, set some standards and then hold people accountable to them. But just saying provide great service isn't, isn't going to get it done. We've got to define it. And even saying to somebody, if you're gonna if you're gonna hold somebody accountable, I'm not gonna say to them, boy, you're not providing great service. I need to give them some examples of what I what I've uh, experienced. Like, I don't see a smiling. I don't see a saying thank you. Uh, do you like working here? If you do, show it. You know, if you don't, then don't work here. Because I, you know, if you've got a disgruntled team member working with you, they're more dangerous than a dissatisfied customer. Because for one thing. They may scare away your great team members. And and also, what are they doing to your customers? So you just can't have these disgruntled people working with you. If they don't like working with you, then don't. Then do something else. That's you know, a- some, people should, some people shouldn't be in the service business. And this is true. My dad was a cattle buyer. He was a, he was a cowboy. My dad... My dad would rather shoot you than serve you. I'm lucky to have gotten out alive. My dad was a great guy, but my dad sorts cattle. Really, my dad was not good at please and thank you. I love my dad, but he was a cowboy. He really was. Dad didn't do customer service. It wasn't who he was. So don't do it then. Some people shouldn't be in the service business. What brought you to customer service then? Because a lot of times we follow the personality traits of our parents. So yeah. was, your, was your mom the pleaser then? Um. Well, my mom was a teacher and very, very nice person. My dad was a nice guy too, just not a retail level of service, which I spent some, I spent 25 years in the grocery store. Um, what happened, Bob, when I was in high school, I was really, really, really shy. Um, I had no friends. I really didn't. And I had a band director and he knew the manager down at the local Dick supermarket. He got me a job. And so I went in for my band lesson on a Tuesday afternoon, and he told me, I got your job down at Dick's Supermarket. And I'm going, oh, my gosh. I said to him, well, isn't that in the public? I can't do that. And he said, do it for me. It'll help you come on your shelf. So I, I didn't want to let him down, so I took the job. And after a couple of weeks doing what I always did, I didn't talk to anybody. The store manager pulled me into his office. He said, Rob, if you don't start saying hi to customers, I'm going to let you go. I'm saying, oh, my gosh, you fire me? So I, I went down on the sales floor, and I was I, honestly, I was freaking out. I mean, I'm 17. I remember this very well. I just, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this. And I saw a customer, and I, I said hi, and he said hi back. Oh, that was cool. Nobody ever talked to me, and I said hi to another customer, and she said hi, and you know, I'm saying, whoa, I'm not the biggest loser in the world. I always thought I was. I just was so shy. And I grew up on a farm. Again, my dad was a cattle buyer. I wasn't one of the cool city kids. And um, retail changed my life. And I I just fell in love with it. And, uh, you know, when you work in a supermarket in a small town, you become famous. (laughs) People go, hey, you work at the grocery (laughs) store. Yes, I do. Did you want me to sign something? I mean, I love working in the store. (laughs) And, you know, when you love what you do, people can feel it, right? Oh, yeah. You can feel it. And I... and. I don't want to sound I'm bragging, but I know people would come in looking for me because I just had a blast with them. Were they bill and collectors? I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm a recovering CPA. I know how to I, I know how to balance my books. You know, my wife keeps me in line too. But um, yeah, that's that's how I did it. And then because I was so shy, I think that's why I really love um, doing what I do as a professional speaker because I really want to help people feel good about themselves. All right, well, let me start with the let me start with the question of how did a shy kid from a small town that played that played in the band that started saying hi to people end up being a professional customer service relations kind of guy? Uh, that's an interesting question. Again, the supermarket helped me, and then um, I remember I was 25 years old, and I was the assistant manager of one of the stores, and I took a carload of cashiers to uh, a, a customer service seminar put on by Gateway Foods, and I still remember the gentleman who provided this program. I've never seen him since. His name was Larry Bussell. And Larry did a great customer service program. And I'd never seen a professional speaker before. And I, I again, I was 25. And I remember thinking, I want to do that. Because I was into customer service. I loved it. I was looking for ways all the time. How can I do it better? And always watching great people. So that started the clock. And, I, and uh, to be honest with you, I didn't go professional speaking until I was 49, so 24 years later. But it was my focus. And then I became the uh, personnel development education and training director for Dick's Supermarkets years later. I was the first one. They'd never had one. And as a professional, as a training director, 
when we'd hire professional speakers, who do you think was at the airport to pick up the speaker, Bob? Me. Who took them back to the airport? Me. And I picked their brains. I'd say, I want to be you when I grow up. How do I do it? And that's how I, you know, I just, I knew this is what I wanted to do. And um, 14 years ago, I left my day job to do it. I've been on the road since. So how does the shy kid then become the uh, the teacher? You know, it's it's funny because I did an interview the other day on my radio program with a guy that was shy, tacky, and a nerd. That's basically how he called himself, but he's uh-huh. a professional speaker now, and he said he's an introvert, and he very much just liked being in front of people, and now he's making money talking in front of people. And and does he enjoy being in front of people now? Well, yeah, that's why he does it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was hoping he wasn't freaking out every time he went on stage. Um, I think, for one thing, I have a lot of empathy for people who don't feel good about themselves. My whole goal is to just plant positive seeds. And so what I, I want to teach, I don't want to teach people just how to provide great service. I want to help people feel good about themselves and realize nobody's better than anyone else and nobody's worse than anybody else. We're all in this together. And if I can help you uh, feel better about yourself, yourself, then, you know, how many people are you going to help? I don't know if I can help one person. I, I did my job. So I think people can feel, you know, in, in, you know um, there's a really important word uh, in anything we do. And I believe it's authenticity. You can tell if somebody's fake, right? And, okay, I'll give you an example. I'm off topic a little bit. There's a lady who manages a convenience store where I live, and she is so over the top, she drives me nuts. You can walk into a yell, hey, how you doing? Like, Shut up. You're freaking me out. You're just way over the top. So we need to be authentic, and I need to be authentic on stage. And so I think the authenticity that I really want to help you, I think, it, I think people feel that. And I hope they do. That's my goal, is that I, I just want to help you feel better about yourself, and the way to feel better about yourself is to help other people. The more you give, the more you get. Explain that to me a little bit, because I've talked to a lot of people over the years that have been very successful in business, very successful in life, and a lot of people have said that same thing, you know, the the, the more you give, the better you get. I think so. Well, for one thing, this is, this is very basic. I use this in some of my programs. My wife and I went to a, a mall in Dubuque, Iowa, a while ago. This is before you could check the weather on your phone. Remember those old days? Those were tough days. And we didn't know there was going to be a snowstorm. We walked out and there was like five inches of snow. It would never go on there. So I'm scraping the window of my car off and this elderly lady with a walker happens to be parked right next to us. So she struggles through the snow. And I said to my wife, I'm going to go help this lady. I'm going to scrape her car off. And I did. And she was so appreciative. And she said, thank you so much. And I said, you're welcome. And I get back in the car and I say to my my wife, I'm the nicest guy in Grant County, Wisconsin. <laughs> I said, just shut up and drive. But what, I, what I'm getting at is I felt as good or maybe better than the person I just helped. And some people think that everybody's taking advantage of them. And so they just want to keep everything they have close to them and they don't want to go go an extra inch or an extra mile. They, they just feel they're being taken advantage of. Well, I believe then your world shrinks. However, when you can give and not worry about getting, you end up getting more than you're giving. How would you define remarkable service? Make me say wow. Provide unexpected joy. And it can be the smallest thing. Remember my name. You know, your name is Bob. My name is Rob. Is your full name Robert, Bob? Yes, it is. See, mine is too. And I like to say, get to know the name. If, if somebody says to me, hey, Bob, how you doing? I mean, you don't even know me. So, so. Do the little things and look for that opportunity. I like, Run to the opportunity. Always be thinking, what can I do? Also, I, I use the case method. I copy and steal everything. Now, I'm not saying I want to break copyright laws, but when I see somebody providing remarkable service, I think, how can I incorporate that into how, how I go to work? It can be just down to how they answer the telephone. That was cool. I love how she answered the phone. How can I incorporate that into what I do? So, you know, where attention goes, energy flows. So it's remarkable service important to you. Look for those ways, you know. And, and so it depends on what you're doing. Um, okay, I'll give you an example. I bought some shoes from Zappos last year, some Nikes. I got them, and uh, they were nice. But the weirdest thing, they started wearing out in less than a month. I couldn't believe it. Just the design was bad. So I called Zappos. I knew they had great service, and I got a lady on the phone. Her name was Andrea. I still remember this. 
And I said, Andrea, I hate to complain. I got these shoes and I'm wearing out. She goes, oh, no, I'm so sorry. She goes, just uh, put them in the box, mail them back to us, and uh, uh, I'll get your refund. I said, well, Andrea, I don't have the box. And, and she goes, don't worry about it, Mr. Bell. I've already credited your account. Keep the shoes, not a problem. I said, you know what I do? I teach customer service. Andrea, you're making me say, wow. And we got talking. So to go to my website. And the next week, I get a, a box from Zappos, and I didn't order anything. And this was a small thing, but I thought it was cool. In it was a very nice notepad with Zappos logo, logo on it, a very nice Zappos pen, and a handwritten note from Andrea saying, Rob, really love your website. Uh, our headquarters are in in Las Vegas. The next time you're in Las Vegas, please stop by, see us, love to give you a tour of the place, love talking to you, and love doing business with you. With you. Best of luck, Andrea. Are you kidding me? Now, see how she went the extra mile? That's the extra. That's five extra miles, don't you think, Bob? Absolutely. Like, did you go? Did, wow. Have you been to Vegas since then? I have not, but I'm definitely going to go uh, check. I hope Andrea's working. This happened to me last year, and I haven't been to Vegas since. But Zach was his headquarters there, and uh, they're really, their customer service is remarkable. And uh, actually, I read a book by their CEO. His name's Tony Shea, H S I E H. And I don't remember the name of the book, unfortunately. Uh, but it's a really fun book on customer service. And um, what I loved about it is he didn't write it all by himself. He asked some of his team members to write chapters, which, again, including his team members to define what remarkable service is. And, um, again, where attention goes, energy flows. Making people say wow is one of their foundational principles, and they live it. As a matter of fact, Bob, I, I – I shot a video about it and put it on YouTube and sent it to Zappos telling them how great I thought Andrea was. And I got a nice note back from one of their people about that. So, so again, they made me say, wow, well, I'm going to try and make them say, wow. So I'm always looking for how can I do some a little extra, just a little bit more. Let me ask you this, Rob, because I know, like I said earlier, and, and, and you agreed that, you know, good customer service now is so few and far between that when we see it, it seems amazing. Do you mention to the person that gives you good customer service, thank you for your service? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mention it to them. I'll send them, uh, I'll send them notes. I actually I have a time carved out on Fridays to send thank you notes to people that I've, that have done something for me or provided great service, or maybe, I, maybe I'll send it to their, to their supervisor. I want to let them know. I want to reinforce it. And in my way, that's hopefully, providing unexpected joy for them. Like, geez, he didn't need to follow up. Well, you did something great for me. I want to do something great for you. And three words I, I keep top of mind, you never know. You never know when you do something nice for someone else how, how it might come back someday. And and you never know where it's going to end up. Or you can be a jerk to somebody and you never know how it can come back and burn you. Can I share a story so, about that real quick? Because, yeah, uh, go for it. I was a lacrosse JC for many years, and I worked at a different radio station than what I work for now. And mm -hmm. the radio station that I work for currently was sponsoring this event that the lacrosse JCs were doing. Well, I wore a radio station shirt from where I used to work to this event, and the owner of the station where I work now came up to me and just said, Hey, Bob, this is a uh, this is a lacrosse radio group event, not uh, not that radio group event. Uh, would you switch? Would you switch your shirt? And I I just took my shirt off, turned it inside out, put it back on, and went back to work. Uh, my boss told me fifteen years later the reason we hired you is because back and back when you did that, it made such a large impression on me that uh, that we hired you because of your personality and because you know you were willing to just do that without any questions and without arguing about it. Isn't that great? There it goes. You never know, right, Bob? You no. never know. You, you so. Never do. Yeah, so err on err on the side of the person, the other people. Again, focus away from yourselves. It's hard to do. We all want to focus on ourselves. I, I like to say in my programs, I want to serve people as if they have M M F I tattooed on their forehead. Make me feel important. That lady, lady who cuts my hair. She's been doing it now for twenty years. Her name's Karen, and she. I get a kick out of her. She's always going to me. You're kind of a big deal, aren't you? <laughs> now, I thought, wow, it must be kind of a big deal. And I left one day, and I heard the next guy going, and, and I heard her say to him, you're kind of a big deal, aren't you? Like, okay, well, <laughs> I, no, I just think that's funny. So she wants to make you feel like a big deal, and she's really a nice person, and I consider her a friend. 
you know, I believe all things being equal, people want to do business with friends, don't you think, Bob? So it's I, that relationship. I would have to agree with you there. I, You know, as I was paging through your book, the book is called Beyond Paper or Plastic. Um, it says something about listening, and I and I am a big proponent of listening because I think that you learn a lot just by uh, by shutting your mouth a lot of times and taking in what's in. But uh, your item six is, uh, is is be a great listener. Mm-hmm. Why do you think listener. Why do you think listening is so important, Rob? Well, it, it's like the line I heard one time: "If you want to be interesting, be interested." So when you really listen to someone else, you are honoring that person. And it's not easy to do, is it? Uh, to to get our self talk focused away from ourselves and really focus. I don't want to listen just to to find a good response. Somebody's telling you a story, and instead of listening to their story, I'm thinking I can I can beat that story. As soon as she shuts up, I'm sure I got a better story than that. You know, let them have the darn story. <laughs> it's your story. Cool, I love it. So. It, I think listening is so important. If you want to provide remarkable service, you need to listen to where they're coming from. You've heard of the golden rule, Bob, do unto others as you would have them them do unto you. Very good rule. However, when it comes to remarkable service, we need to take it up a level. You may have heard of it, the platinum rule. Treat people the way they want to be treated. The golden rule assumes you want to be treated the same way I want to be treated, and and sometimes that's not a very good assumption. I'm a 62-year-old man from Wisconsin who wears a piece of cheese on his head on Sundays. You may not be, right? So how do you want to be treated? And you, the only way you can figure that out is to really, really listen and shut down our self-talk, just really focus. As I mentioned, the book is called Beyond Paper or Plastic, Eight Items or Less to Remarkable Service. We've hit on a lot of the, uh, a lot of the items here, Rob. What would be the top three, you think, for somebody to take away from this podcast? Well, number one, make it a priority. And I said it a couple of times already, where attention goes, energy flows. If you're going to provide remarkable service, make it a priority. Number two, love what you do. If you don't love it, do something else. And I said earlier, I'm a recovering CPA. I was an auditor. I hated it. I hated it. Went to school, got my accounting degree, and then realized I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong field. My ladder's up against the wrong wall. I, I hate it. So love what you do. And number three, be authentic. Be you. Don't try and be somebody else. Because fake doesn't work. Those are my top three today. Tomorrow, ask me, I might have another top three. I think those are three important ones. Why is loving what you do an important thing for people to do? Well, I think people can tell if you, you can't fake it. You can't fake remarkable service. It, it's got to come from the heart. Again, back to that authenticity. And, and you can't be trained to provide great service if you don't love providing great service. You know, I, I do a lot of work with uh, healthcare organizations, and, and that takes a special kind of person to do that. And I love working with healthcare organizations because the people in healthcare really care, or they couldn't do it. It's too hard. Yeah, I think if you go into healthcare and you don't love it, you'll get out of it quick. And, and a lot of people in retail don't love it. It's just a job. And so they're not going to be very good at it, and they're not going to have much success at it. So... I, I, I think you got to love it. You need, you need to be authentic. What is your most useless talent? Uh, playing the clarinet. You know, and a lot of rock bands don't need them. Now, Supertramp had a clarinet. But, uh, yeah, I uh, playing the clarinet it hasn't really helped me out in my real world that much. Professional speaker Rob Bell uh, on the BSing with Bob podcast, Beyond Paper or Plastic, Eight Items or Less to Remarkable Service. Rob, how do people find you? I have a, a website. It's pretty easy, robspeaks.com. And what will they find there? Well, they'll find a video of me in action. Uh, they can buy my book. They can find my phone number. Give me a call if they just want to shoot the breeze. If you want to just talk about how to provide great service, I'll talk to you. If you want to talk about how to get into the uh, professional speaking business, I'll talk to you. I love talking shop. So I just want to help people. That's what we're here for. The BSing with Bob Schmidt podcast is brought to you by Orange Computer. Find them online at orangecomputerlax.com. This has been another podcastforhire.com production.